basic equations. In this video, I'll continue talking about random variables. We already know that random variables describe properties of a random sample. A random variable is a function, and functions are very complex objects. In this video, we look at ways to summarize the potentially complex behavior of a random variable. We will look at the expectation, the variance, and the covariance. The expectation is a measure of the center of the distribution of a random variable. The variance is a measure of the spread of the distribution of a random variable. The covariance quantifies the co-movement between two random variables. Let's look again at the population consisting of Alice, Ben and Carl. Let's assume that Alice is 24 years old, Ben is 18 years old and Carl is 21 years old. As before, x1 is the random variable that gives the age of the first observation. In the future, we have drawn the sample and we know what it is. Let's assume that we have drawn the sample Ben Carl. The realized value of x1, that is x1, evaluated at the realized sample, is 18, since Ben is 18 years old. Today, we don't know what the realization of x1 will be, but we can try to predict it. For our purposes, a prediction is a number that we use today as a guess for the future value of x1. We don't want to just predict any number, we want to make good predictions. Suppose that we predict 50. Given that the oldest person in the population is 24, no matter who we end up sampling, the true value of x1 will be substantially smaller than 50. Clearly, predicting, for example, 24 instead of 50 would have made for a much better prediction. It turns out that a good prediction of x1 is the expectation of x1. To indicate that we are computing the expectation of a random variable, we use the expectation operator, capital E, and put the name of the random variable, here, x1, in brackets. To compute the expectation, we sum over all samples in the sample space. For each sample, we take the value of x1 evaluated on the sample, and multiply it by the probability p of omega, that is the probability of drawing this particular sample. For example, one of the samples that we have to sum over is the sample LSBEN. So we take x1 evaluated at LSBEN, and since LS is 24 years old, that would be 24. Now we multiply it by the probability of drawing LSBEN. If everyone gets drawn with equal probability, then this probability will be 1 third times 1 third, or 1 over 9. We also have to consider the sample ben Ka, so let's add that as well. So x1 evaluated on Ben Carr is 18, since Ben is 18 years old. And again, the probability is 1 over 9. We continue in the same way for all the other possible samples. For this example, you can verify that the expectation is 21. As you can see, the expectation gives us a probability weighted average of all possible values of x1. An expectation will always be a single number. I've claimed before that the expectation is a good prediction for a random variable. But just how good is it? And anyway, how do we measure how good a prediction is? The variance of a random variable is a measure of how accurately the random variable is predicted by its expectation. Suppose that we draw Alice first. Then x1 will take the value 24. The expectation of x1 is 21. Therefore, we are off by three years. Clearly, the difference between actual value and prediction can be positive or negative. We want to get rid of the sign. One way to do this is to square the difference. Here we get a squared difference of 9. If we draw Ben first, then x1 will take the value 18. 18 minus 21 is minus 3 and squared, that gives us 9 again. If we draw a car first, then our prediction is exact, and the squared difference between realization and prediction will be 0. The variance of a random variable is a concept that uh, uses this notion of a squared difference between the realization of a random variable and its expected value. 
To indicate that we are computing the variance of a random variable, we use the variance operator. The variance is based on the square difference between x1 and its expectation. This is a transformation of a random variable, so it is in turn a random variable um, that is a random quantity. To reduce this random quantity to a single number, we take its expectation. As you can see, the variance measures the expected distance of a random variable from its expectation. A variance is always a single number and is always non-negative. So how do we interpret small or large values of a variance? A small variance of x1 means that for most samples we get similar values of x1. Most here means samples that we draw with large probability. In this scenario, it is sensible to represent x1 by one single number, its expectation, and the expectation will be a good predictor of the realization of x1. If the variance of x1 is large, then x1 takes on vastly different values for different samples. In this case, the expectation of x1 is not a good predictor of its realization. We can use densities to illustrate the difference between a small and a large variance. Let's start by looking at a random variable x1 with a large variance. As you can see, the distribution of x1 is fairly spread out. The expectation of x1 lies at the center of the distribution, but it is not a good representative of the rest of the distribution. We may end up far from the expectation with fairly large probability. Now let's look at a scenario where x1 has a small variance. The distribution is tightly centered around the expectation. We may end up far away from the expectation, but the probability of that happening is fairly small. A measure that is closely related to the variance is the standard deviation of a random variable. The standard deviation of a random variable x1 is defined as the square root of its variance. Why is it appealing to look at the square root of the variance? Remember that in defining the variance we are squaring a difference. The square difference is then measured, for example, in square years. Square years are very hard to interpret. By taking the square root, we are returning the units of measurement to just simply years. You could say that the standard deviation of a random variable measures the distance of the random variable from its expectation in the correct units of measurement. We now understand how to use the variance of a random variable to measure how well the random variable is predicted by its expectation. This puts us now into a position where I can make my claim that the expectation is a good prediction a little more precise. In fact, we will now learn that not only is the expectation a good prediction, it is actually, in a way, the best prediction. Suppose that today we are predicting a number a. a could be equal to the expectation of x1, or it could be any other number. We take the square difference between x and a, and again, to remove randomness, we take the expectation. Clearly, values of a that make this expectation small are better predictions and are preferred. What is the value of a that makes this expectation the smallest? It turns out the optimal a to choose is exactly the expectation. The expectation is an optimal prediction in the sense that it minimizes the expected square distance. The expected square distance is also called the squared loss. The expectation and the variance both describe a single random variable using a number. The expectation is a measure of the center of the distribution. If we have to guess how a random variable will realize, the expectation gives a good prediction. The variance is a measure of the spread of the distribution. If the variance is small, then it is easier to predict the random variable. Now we want to move on from looking at a single random variable to looking at multiple random variables at the same time. An important concept for describing the relationship between two random variables is the notion of statistical dependence. Random variables y1 and y2 are statistically dependent if by observing y1 we learn something about y2. Or conversely, if by observing y2 we learn something about y1. 
random variables y1 and y2 are statistically independent if by observing one random variable we don't learn anything about the other random variable. As before, let x1 denote the random variable that gives the age of the first observation. Also, let x2 denote the random variable that gives the age of the second observation. Recall that we are sampling completely at random and with replacement. Therefore, learning the age of the first observation is completely uninformative about the age of the second observation, and vice versa. This means that x1 and x2 are statistically independent. Let's look at another example. Let w denote the average of x1 and x2. x1 and w are statistically dependent. Why is that? Suppose that I draw Alice first. Alice is the oldest member of the population. Even if in the second draw I draw only an averaged aged person, I will still see a rather large sample average of age. The fact that I have drawn Alice drives up the average. The covariance is a measure of how strong the dependence between two random variables is. The covariance between random variables y1 and y2 is defined by multiplying the deviation of y1 from its expectation with the deviation of y2 from its expectation and then integrating out randomness by taking an expectation. Let's explore the intuition behind this definition. In a 2D plane, every sample can be represented by a y1, y2 pair. We put y1 values on the horizontal axis and y2 values on the vertical axis. We can also represent the expectations of y1 and y2 like this. This splits the 2D plane into four quadrants, 1, 2, 3, and 4. The example sample omega is in quadrant 2. This means that at omega, y1 takes an above average value and y2 takes a below average value. The contribution of omega to the covariance will multiply a positive value by a negative value and will therefore be negative. Let's put more points into the diagram. All these points represent possible samples. The size of the points represents the probability of drawing such a sample. You should check that samples in quadrants 2 and 4 contribute negative values to the covariance. Samples in quadrants 1 and 3 contribute positive values to the covariance. The way I have drawn it most of the samples concentrate in quadrants 2 and 4. This means that overall the covariance will be negative. We can interpret this to mean that above average values of y1 tend to go together with below average values of y2. Also, above average values of y2 tend to go together with below average values of y1. In this case we say y1 and y2 are negatively correlated. If the covariance is positive, then above average values of y1 tend to go together with above average values of y2. In this case we say y1 and y2 are positively correlated. If the covariance is zero, then we say that y1 and y2 are uncorrelated. Zero covariance means that the covariance does not detect a relationship between y1 and y2. The covariance measures certain aspects of statistical dependence. If two random variables y1 and y2 are correlated, that is, if they are either negatively or positively correlated, then y1 and y2 are statistically dependent. The relationship in the other direction does not hold. Two random variables can be statistically dependent and still be uncorrelated. In other words, there are some kinds of statistical dependence that are not picked up by the covariance. Let's summarize what we've learned so far. We have discussed the expectation, the variance, and the covariance. They all condense certain aspects of the behavior of random variables into a single number. The variance and the covariance both are special kinds of expectations. The expectation and the variance 
both describe properties of a single random variable. The covariance describes the relationship of two random variables. As you might have guessed from the names, the variance and the covariance are related. It is not hard to show that the covariance of a random variable with itself is its variance. 